Welcome to Category 5 Technology TV. It's so great to see you. So nice to have you here this week. Um, tonight, we are looking at a Raspberry Pi. We're using a GPIO breakout so that we can program it to do some cool stuff. Now, tonight, we're just getting started with the basics. We're going to turn on and off a light bulb. Uh, but this starts it all. It does. This is where it starts. There goes the bank. <laughs> we're also going to be unboxing an Atomos. Uh, Ninja Flame. It's a recorder that records in 4K, and we've got one right here at the studio. Stick around. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Our live recordings are trusted only to solid-state drives by Kingston Technology. Revive your computer with improved performance and reliability over traditional hard drives with Kingston SSDs. Category 5 TV streams live with Telestream Wirecast and Nimble Streamer. Tune in every week on Roku, Kodi, Plex, and other HLS video players. For local showtimes, visit Category5.tv. Category5.tv is a member of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. Cat5.tv slash TPN and the International Association of Internet Broadcasters. Cat5.tv slash IAIB. Welcome to Category 5 TV, everybody. This is episode number 571, and I'm Robbie Ferguson. I'm Jeff Weston. I am Sasha Rickman. How's everybody doing? Good. Awesome. You? What a week. It's been a wild week. And you guys know, because like you're here, and it's like running around, and I'm rewiring a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah, what were you up to? Oh, well, we've got all kinds of things going on at the studio, but we, as you know, had some issues where our recorder failed. Yes. So the drive that we use to record Category 5 TV actually failed on us. And for the past few weeks, we've been kind of makeshifting and figuring out how to, right. how to get by and, uh, and put out the plea um, that we needed to raise the funds, figure out a way to be able to replace the recorder. And lo and behold, a viewer sent us uh, an Atomos Ninja Flame this week. Ooh. And uh, so that we're going to unbox tonight. I'm going to show you what it looks like. We're going to get into the box, into the accessories, and show you kind of where, uh, you know, what, what that is. And uh, full disclosure, we actually pre-recorded the unboxing so that we can hook it up and wire everything in tonight. So, so we're kind of in a makeshift in-between phase this mm -hmm. week because we're still recording to disk as right. kind of our fail-safe because that's how we've always done it and we don't want to take the risk of accidentally hooking something up wrong right. when I haven't read the manuals yet. But before the show, running all the cables, running all the wires and making it happen so that things are ready to go. And here we go. Yeah. I like it. So very, very excited about it. Now, that is a very expensive piece of hardware for one viewer to, uh, to contribute to the show. Um, if it's something that you would like to pitch in on, then uh, please head on over to our tip jar and, uh, and do whatever you feel um, that you'd like to do. And, and just pop me a quick email that uh, just tells us to allocate that. And what we'll do is we'll actually take any contributions toward um, that recorder and we will kind of donate it back to the person who contributed that hardware just to kind of offset the cost mm. because oh. it's it's quite quite astronomical really so that's one and see this is what awesome i love person. about the cat5 community like everything about this show is people pitching in helping out i mean i think of sasha's computer for dave and i think of all the various upgrades we've had around the studio and mm -hmm. it's all because people love what we do and they're like yeah i gotta help out but it's, you know, it's even like the kindness. Like yeah. I, I had been suffering from headaches, you know, for, well, I still am a little bit, but I had a, one of the viewers email me and say, hey, listen, I used to suffer. Here's something that you might want to try. Hmm. Turns mm -hmm. out I need a root canal. <laughs> is that what it is? Oh, That's no. what it is. So I'm probably the only person on earth excited for a root canal. I am really looking forward to it. Poor my Sasha appointment's on Friday. for weeks Friday. has been like, I have a headache. Well, it started affecting I my... Headache. See, I just assumed it was the contacts, and that's why you're back to glasses. Oh, right. No, yeah. no. So it started affecting the vision in my left eye, but it turns out oh, that that's the... the worst. The, the nerve that is attached to that tooth, I guess it also attaches to your eye. So that I'm oh. having referred pain into my that eye, does happen which yeah. presents as a migraine huh. right. 
Of course, if I get the root canal and the pain doesn't go away, then we have other problems. But So when's this happening? On when, Friday. On Friday. Yes. Okay. So, again, it's the community. I wouldn't have even thought anything of it had I not right. been here and had somebody listening with an open heart, right? And sure. it's it's huge. So thank you. And I appreciate, the, like, because I come and do this every single week, mm-hmm. right? Um, I very missed a week and you two have been gracious to fill in for me when i've needed to and we thoroughly botched it <laughs> we did a bad job <laughs> not at all not at all um but with that you know when when something like a hard drive crashes or right. you know, something goes wrong or, or tonight having some trouble before beforehand with wirecast not working and and things like that because something was wrong with the keyboard shortcuts and you know all these kinds of things i'm the guy who has to deal with this so that stress comes down on me the technical stress. So when the community comes together and when I know that the community's there, it's like, for me, that's uplifting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I can never get discouraged even when things are tough because something like this happens where a viewer sees the need and says, I can fill that need. Yeah. And so, you know, big group hug to the community, um, to everybody who has ever watched Category 5 TV, supported us in any way. Even just giving us a thumbs up or a subscribe on YouTube is a way to support Category 5 TV, and we appreciate that very much. And if you haven't done it, why haven't you done it? Please do. <laughs> Give us that thumbs up. <laughs> subscribe. <laughs> click the bell. It's good times. Well, I have to say that now. Click, click the bell? Click the bell. There's a bell? There's a bell that will oh, notify you when we post new videos. That's what? I have that bell clicked. Nice. <laughs> Hold on. I definitely get notified. On YouTube. On YouTube. So when you subscribe. Is it on the app? It's No, when you subscribe, right next to it, there's a bell. Yeah, yeah but it does says, it show up on the app? Yes. I, really? Yeah, it's a li- yeah, it does. Wait, is it, is is it, it like, the app that I have, or do I just go on? Is, the, it, is it like a brand new feature? Because I, no. like I was on YouTube You'll like two days well. ago, and I haven't seen a bell. Hmm. Huh. Hmm. It could just say get notified. <laughs> what have we started? Maybe okay. I need to update my app. Check no, it's it a brand new phone. There you go. There you go. <laughs> hey to the chat room. Hello, everybody. They're active so great tonight. To see yeah, and it's, it's tough. I want to go down the list, but then I know because there are so many of you that I can't possibly go down the list because then I'm going to admit somebody. It's mm-hmm. true. But it's so great to have you here. Thanks for those who have been pitching in in the chat room as well, kind of keeping things uh, pleasant. Keeping me super entertained as well. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes you guys are talking and I forget that we're actually live and I'm just like, oh, yeah, in here. Yeah, we're, uh, we're here. Do I secretly do enjoy those moments when you're like engrossed in the camera and then Robbie will pull out and you're just like, because <laughs> it's like, oh, she got caught. I know. That's fun. Clearly, I love the chat room a lot. The yes, you the do. Yes. So tonight, we've got a lot of fun stuff planned. Of course, we're going to get right into um, unboxing the Atomos Ninja Flame. Yeah, we will. Um, later on tonight, we're going to be looking at the Raspberry Pi. You notice I've got a Raspberry Pi with a GPIO cable sticking out of it. Very colorful That's one, That's what the way. that is. That I is said it was a is. Snapchat filter thing, which ah. nobody understands, but it's exactly yeah. what it is looks like. Is that something like. the kids do? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Is <laughs> it Twitter? No, it's not Twitter. It's mm. like a thing. Mm. You open your mouth and then a rainbow pours out. Oh, I have seen that one. It waves. Yeah. There's, you'll see them on YouTube it looks videos. just like that. Okay. Yeah. It's my GPIO. So We're going to G- be showing you how to, how to set that up and uh, how to do a little bit of basic programming tonight uh, as we kind of prepare for all of the fun stuff that we're going to be doing uh, over the next little while. I like fun. Yeah, as we learn how to use the Raspberry Pi for programming and uh, external devices doing that kind of stuff. You had fun when we were doing Arduino. Yes. So this is going to be, this is going to take it to the next level because this is a full Linux computer with 40-pin GPI. Super Ooh. cool. That's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, we do have to take a really quick break. When we come back, I'm, I'm just going to take this time to mosey on over to the uh, review table and uh, we're going to make it look like it's live. I'm going to hop over there and we're going to do an unboxing right after this. All right. For a limited time, get your hands on limited edition shirts from the Category 5 TV network. These high quality shirts are manufactured by Teespring, a fundraising website, and your purchase will help support the shows we produce. Get yours today and send us your pictures to be featured on the corresponding show. Visit cat5.tv shirts to support us and get your official network shirt today. Cat5. 
Radio105.tv slash shirts. Welcome back. In just a few minutes, we're going to be taking a look at the Raspberry Pi. But before we do that, we're going to go over to the review desk with Robbie to take a look at the Atomos Ninja Flame unboxing. All right, let's get right into it. We've got the Ninja Flame recorder right here. I'm just going to get right into the box. Okay. This looks like it's pretty easy to get into. Nice. Oh, it's stuck on the zipper. That's the end of it. <laughs> there we go. All right. There it is. So it comes with kind of like, it's like a soft hard shell case. It's not quite hard. It's not quite soft, but it's definitely, it's got some sponginess to it. I think that's going to protect things pretty well, even if you don't get the accessory kit. Here we are. And ladies and gentlemen, the Atomos Ninja. Ba -da -da -da. This is the flame model, so that means it is 30 frames per second, 4K, woohoo, ProRes 422. Beautiful. Now it looks like a screen, right? It looks like our Lilliput screen. Uh, but this is actually not just a screen, it's also a 4K, 30p um, ProRes recorder. So an SSD is going to go into here and slide in there. Just like that, we've got a spot for two batteries here, and they are hot swappable. They recharge while they're connected, so if one is dead, you can pull it out, put in another one, and, and so on, and just keep on going. Uh, okay, so first things I notice, we've got quarter-inch mounting on the bottom as well as the top. It's nice if you want to have, uh, have it hanging from like a, a gimbal system or something like that versus mounted directly onto the camera. We've got a mic and line input. We've got a headphone jack. Nice power ja uh, button there. And then it looks like we've got like a screw on DC input, 6.2 volts. So that's kind of nice. We're not going to have to worry about like the barrel connector getting accidentally unplugged from that. So the Ninja Flame has HDMI, and so that's 4K and uh, no SDI, which uh, I don't need here at the studio, so uh, we opt out of that. Like, that's not something that we need at all uh, because we're fully HDMI here. So we can take an HDMI signal in, hit record, and output to our monitors, to uh, another deck, whatever we want to do. Uh, I see a jack here for uh, a remote as well. And I can't wait to plug it into HDMI. I'm wondering if I'm going to um, be able to trigger it from the HDMI. I don't know that yet. Haven't even plugged it in yet, as you know. I'm just taking it out of the box for the first time. Um, but wouldn't that be neat? I, I don't want to get my hopes up, but what if? What if? Otherwise, I think it's going to hold a lot of video, so I can just hit record and let it go. Um, so that's great. Okay. Back down here. What else is in this kit here? So this is the, like what you get with just the, uh, just the recorder itself. We've got a quick start guide. Looks like it's only a couple of pages here. Yeah, it's like a real visual kind of pull out flyer, nice and easy. Nice and straightforward, nothing overwhelming. And there we go, we've got a power adapter. So that is, now I don't see a screw um, feature. So as I was mentioning on the back of the Atomos uh, Ninja Flame, there is the option to screw it in. However, this particular charger that comes with it doesn't have that. Now that said, it's pretty snug. I don't think that's going to get pulled out of there at all. Um, if you're working in the field, you might want to get one that screws in. I think that that's nice that it's got the threading. I didn't expect that, nor do I really need it here in our studio, but... That's cool. So here's the power brick, looks like. And we've got adapters for, looks like China, the UK, um, what is that, 210? 220? I don't know. And then we've got the 110 for here in Canada and the United States. So that's kind of nice that it's universal out of the box. So if you're doing any shooting and traveling, then you're going to be able to take this with you and uh, there you go, comes with the adapter. All right. 
Now that I've put that together, is it gonna go back into the box? That's the question. Now that I've put that on. No, I guess you gotta take it apart. There you go. That's all right. Looks like we've got a couple of a uh, couple more pieces of foam that we could remove here. So if you have other accessories, that's a bonus. That's something that uh, typically you'd have to buy another case for. Uh, we do have another case in the accessory pack, but that's nice that it comes with that. If you want to throw an SD card holder, something like that in there, or whatever else, maybe a couple of batteries. Um, if you've got them, that kind of thing, that's great. Okay, so that is the recorder. Let's put it all back together here. So you can see it, it packs up real quick, real nice. If you want to take it with you. There we go, let's set this aside here, and then I'm gonna get right into our accessory kit. Wow, that's got some heft to it. All right, so what does it look like here? We've got uh, a handle, there you go. Um, so this comes with a whole bunch of stuff, I'm just gonna tear into it, um, and it's hard to, hard to kind of get a shot here. Maybe if we pull over to this camera here, we'll be able to see the, the wider shot a little better. There we go. And let's just kind of get in there this way. I'm just going to set it down here, folks, for just a moment. And there we go. So this, it's nice that the accessory kit comes with a good, wow, looks like weather tight, um, waterproof case. It looks like a waterproof case. It's got the, uh, got an air vent and everything. You guys see that? All right. I'm going to get it out of the wrap. Oh, I need scissors. I seriously need scissors for this? Don't worry, I got some. All right, there we go. Okay. Beaut. Now, one of the things, the first thing that I do notice is a couple of the reviews that I've seen online. And I guess this foam is just for the packing. Uh, a couple of the reviews I've seen online, they had, when these first came out, they had these bright kind of orange or red neon looking things for the case, but they have obviously made it black now, which just looks a little, you know, it, it doesn't stand out. Doesn't make somebody want to run up and grab it on you, that kind of thing. All right, let's get down here. So we've got a name plate so that we can put our name in there. We've got locking holes here if you want to get some padlocks to keep it locked up. Now remember folks, I have not been into this yet. So I don't even know how to open it. There we go. So this is not just a case. As you see, this is the full accessory kit uh, for the Atmos Ninja Flame. Now, this accessory kit from Atomos is designed to work with, uh, with all of their 4K uh, field recorders. Uh, so that's the Inferno or Flame series. So it's not limited to just the Ninja Flame that we have here today. Um, and that means that these batteries are interchangeable between devices if you happen to have more than one as well. 5,200 milliamp hours looks good and hefty. And that is an NPF 750. So I think that these are actually the same kind of batteries that go into our lighting rig. Yeah, so that's cool. So that means I've already got uh, a couple of extras kicking around as well. Um, so those are pretty common batteries. If you've already got studio gear, you're probably already using these. That's fantastic. Um, these are a little heftier though, so at 5,200 milliamp hours, we should be able to get some pretty good life out of that. Okay, we've got uh, some kind of breakout cable. Uh, I don't ever use any of the internal miking or anything on a camera, so I'm not sure what this is for. Um, I'm sure the first person to Google it is going to uh, raise some noise in, in the comments below, for sure. Uh, it's not a headphone jack. It's uh, about eighth inch. No, no, it's smaller. It's like a sixteenth. It's tiny anyways. All right, moving on to the caddies, something that I know about. All right, so we just get an SSD drive and put it in there. So there, and then this becomes the case for our SSD. And then here's a docking station with USB 3, which is nice. I'm glad that they included this because now I can dock my drives to, uh, to the system. I hope it works on Windows. I'm going to be trying that. 
Sure it does. I've got Windows 10 on our broadcast system for editing and things, uh, but it's nice not having to go out and find a docking station that will fit because this won't fit into a normal tray now because, uh, or a docking station without first removing it from the caddy, so that does away with, the, uh, with that problem. All right. We've got a couple of holes here for more batteries if you want to purchase some more. Um, looks like the uh, Atmos Ninja Flame will fit right in here. Let's actually grab it. I'm going to reopen this box because we're going to consolidate. We'll consolidate everything into one carrying case. All right, so here we go. Let's put this in here. Beautiful. There we go. All right, and then I can set this. The one that came along with it, that could be handy to take, you know, if you need something a little more portable. All right, let's get underneath here and see what else we have. All right, we've got a, a, a hood, a sun shield, a sun hood, whatever you want to call it. There you go. Let's get her out of the packaging and see how this looks. All right, we've got a couple of different pieces. Not sure if they're magnetic or how they go. The true unboxing. Yes, it says right on it, magnetic quick release. Warning. Okay, so I noticed that it has a nice little trap door here for doing puppet shows and things like that. Uh, but we'll be able to reach in to be able to get our hands into the, uh, to the um, uh, touch screen. All right, so put this in here. There we go. I'm going to set all this up. Remember, I'm going to set this up. We're going to do a demo. This is really just an unboxing, and I haven't seen this stuff yet, so I haven't really learned how all the puzzle pieces go together. Uh, but we will figure that out and give you another demo. All right. Oh, and it comes with instructions specifically for guys like me to figure out how to put that together. Okay, looks like another charger, just like the one that I had in the other kit. So this is gonna be a backup, I suppose. Um, but if you didn't have one, there you go. Um, but this also, check this out. Oh, how do you get that out? Oh, you can go underneath, okay. So this one will plug into a battery charger for the batteries. There we go. Swell. All right. We've got a shoulder strap. We've got another cable of sorts. This is like uh, power for the screen if your camera supports that. Or if you've got some kind of separate um, power pack. Then we've got a couple of quarter inch um, adapters here. A little riser to be able to um, mount your Atomos screen to... Uh, to your camera or whatever else, your mounting rig. Then we've got the, uh, the parts for the, uh, the power adapter itself. So that looks like everything that's in the box. There you go. That is the Atomos Ninja Flame. And we're going to be seeing in the next couple of weeks how this compares to, say, for example, recording straight to SSD, how it compares to shooting video directly to SD card on our video camera. We have a 4K camera, and we're going to put this to the test by um, shooting some footage um, recorded both to the internal card and to the Atomos Ninja Flame as well. Um, all right, so we're going to head right back over to our desk over here. Thanks, Robbie. That was an unboxing of the Atmos Ninja Flame. What a beautiful product. All right, stick around because in just a few seconds when we come back, we're going to be taking a, take a look at a Raspberry Pi and, uh, take, and going to be using it with the GPIO. Don't go anywhere. Whether you shop on ThinkGeek, GearBest, B&H Photo Video, eBay, or Amazon, or even if you want a free trial of Audible, 
you'll find the best deals and support the shows we produce by simply visiting the shopping sites you already frequent by using the links on our website. Visit category5.tv slash partners for the full and ever-growing list and help us create more free content like this show. Thank you for shopping with our partners and thank you for watching. Welcome back. This is Category 5 Technology TV. I'm your host, Robbie Ferguson. That's Jeff. I'm Sasha. That's Sasha. And uh, tonight, we're looking at the Raspberry Pi GPIO. So this is a way that you can program external devices to do things. All right. So Raspberry Pi, we've looked at it as a microcomputer. We've looked at it as um, something that we could build a retro Pi on so that you can play video games and things Mine like that. Mine cryptocurrency on. Mine cryptocurrency on at nine hashes per second. That's right. And, you know, it, it's, it's a fantastic piece of kit. But you can take it to the next level because there's a 40-pin GPIO on there, which is a whole bunch of pins that you can connect cables to and program what you want those cables to do. Right. So we're going to start with the most simple example tonight that could ever be possible. We're just going to turn on and off a light. But along with that, we're going to kind of learn what we need in order to get started. Because as we grow as makers, we need to be able to um, have the kit so that right. we're, we're ready to go. Obviously, we're going to need a Raspberry Pi. My kit is a Raspberry Pi 3. Um, I love this guy here. You've seen it on the show from yes. cat5.tv slash maker. Just because it comes with things like bags and bags of many different ohmage resistors, for example. Like it just comes with tons and tons of resistors. You can buy all this stuff separately, but buying the kit as a beginner maker, this just gave me a whole bunch of stuff to get started. I've got uh, various um, capacitors. I've got various um, transistors and switches, all kinds of stuff. You got all I the stuff. It. I got a couple relays there. So as we grow, we mm -hmm. can start using more and more of this kit. Mm -hmm. So tonight, for example, I needed to pull out some resistors. So I needed a resistor, I needed an LED, I needed a couple of cables, mm -hmm. and I need to be able to program my GPIO to turn on and off this light bulb. Okay. Over the next little while, Category 5 TV is going to be looking more and more at beginner electronics. We've looked at some in the past, and we've really wanted to get going on, uh, on some of the projects that we can do here. And uh, we've done some pretty cool stuff, but that's going to grow over time. And the Raspberry Pi is an interesting one because it's a full Linux computer. Right. I have a question. Yeah. What does GPIO stand for? Oh, gosh. GPIO. You could yeah. have Googled that as well as I. GPIO stands for General Purpose Input Output. Oh, okay. That's the pins on a right. Raspberry Pi, for example. Um, and yes, I had to Google perfect. that because I'm a beginner maker, and I'm okay with that. Right. I just assume you know everything. Like the no. last you'd no, be like, well, bam. No, so Don't often, though, in, the, that in the tech world, we have acronyms that you just use or short forms, and it, it just becomes part of the lingo, and then you're right. like, oh, what does that I mean? know. LED is light-emitting diode. Nicely done. Right. Nicely yes. done. So I, I've got okay. one of those. So with the GPIO, these are all those pins. Remember, there's 40 pins on the Raspberry Pi board. Right. But... I want my board to be in this nice little case. It's an El Arduino. I love this case. It's aluminum. I've got a heat sink on the CoPro and the, uh, the CPU mm -hmm. internally there, and it's an aluminum chassis. It keeps it nice and cool with passive cooling, so there's no fans either. But if I want to use a case, mm -hmm. well, now it's really, really tough to get in to do the GPIO, putting things right. on the pins and things like that. So that's where uh, GPIO, breakout cable, cobbler, for example, would work really well. So I have this, what we call, uh, well, it's, it's a cobbler. Uh, I'm going to see if I can get in here just hey, a sir. little bit closer. So this is a GPIO cable coming out of the side of the case, and it's plugged into the GPIO on the Raspberry Pi, and inside it looks just like that. Okay? So it's just an extender. Everything from it the inside. Is. Yeah. Just so the uh, inside GPIO has been br basically brought along these cables right. and into this what looks like an old IDE. It's a 40-pin oh, okay. GPIO connector. So then I have the T-Cobbler Plus V2.2. And this is available at cat5.tv slash pi, and I love this. Because part of, you know, doing this is it's really tough to get 
the right pins and you need a diagram to figure out what pin is what and so on and so forth, right? Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes if you get it wrong, you can cause damage to either the peripheral you're connecting or the Pi itself. Now, one quick question because it was mm -hmm. just brought up in the chat room that it looks like the old IDE cables. Is it that really does. It, 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 is it just an IDE cable or is it something totally different? Uh, ID, because I would hate for somebody to go, oh, I'm going to really pull that out like of an one. old computer and then No, it really looks up. like one. I seem to recall that IDE, though, had a, a pin that was, um, that was blocked out. Uh, let's see. Yes. So okay, here's so it's not here's like the IDE same thing. cable. No, because IDE had a, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I wish that that was a bigger photo. Um, no, it looks pretty similar. No, it's 34 pin, uh, but there's a 40 pin. Okay, so I, I don't know the answer to that, but okay. there, that does look like a 40 pin cable. Okay. So maybe they're the same. Which okay. really, hey, if you're a pack rat and you've got some old AT. Well, that's the funny thing. I, I do have some at home. Bring one in. Okay. Let's try um, yeah. this cable. I don't know if the pin assignments would be exact or proper. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Uh, but we'll they definitely out. look the same. What the T-Cobbler Plus V2.2 does though, it's, it, first of all, it's a pre-built board, mm -hmm. okay? So I didn't have to assemble this cobbler. Um, and what the cobbler does is it allows me to connect to my breadboard for prototyping. Okay. Easily, right. without having to run a whole bunch of cables out of the Raspberry Pi. It's just one cable that I plug into the T-Cobbler. Oh, perfect. Okay. okay. So why the T-Cobbler versus like a standard cobbler is... Now, a standard cobbler is going to just get rid of the T part. That's why this one's called a T-Cobbler, right? So that would be a standard cobbler. That's T-Cobbler. The T-Cobbler, because it's got more space, because remember, if you have a, just a normal cobbler, the uh, interface is in the middle here, right. so there's not a lot of writing on the board. It's really, really tough to see the pins. Nice thing about the T-Cobbler is every single one of these pins is labeled. That's helpful. So you can see the pin number, you can see which ones are 5 volt, 3 volt, ground. It's labeled right on the circuit. Okay. So then you need a breadboard. It came with my kit, cat5.tv slash maker. Um, you just simply plug the T-cobbler into your breadboard and then plug your IDE cable. IDE cable, there I go. Now you're doing it. <laughs> plug your GPIO cable directly into the T-cobbler. And that's all there is to it. So it just works like that. So now my breadboard is set up to be a Raspberry Pi GPIO beast. Right. Okay. So what I've done is I now have the ground going to the negative on my breadboard, and I have um, pin 18. I've got that going down to here. I'm just going to move my laptop for you. And I've got a 220 ohm resistor going to the positive, and then an LED. Um, the resistor is so that I don't cause damage to my uh, to my Raspberry Pi. I don't want to damage the Pi if I draw too much current from the LED. And I used a 220 because I wanted it to be bright enough for you to be able to see tonight. Um, that will just give it a little bit more brightness than, say, a 370 ohm. Um, so let's give it a go. You want to take a look? Yes. All right. So I'm, uh, I've got everything kind of set up. There it is. I've already loaded Python as root. And uh, so I'm, I'm raring to go. So now that I've got this all set up, got my LED here, I've got the uh, pin 18 is the one I'm using, and I've got the ground going to the negative, so I'm set. Now, one question I, I have, sorry, before you go to it, is there a reason why you have them situated on the board that way specifically, or was it just, for somebody who's looking at this going, I don't know how to use a Never breadboard. Done it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just so that they know in case they're trying to replicate sure. this at home. It's, it's tough for me to let, you know what, I'm going to make this happen. I'm going to show you what I've done. You don't have to, uh, the way a breadboard works is, and you don't have to copy Robbie's way of doing it exactly. So on the far right here is the negative and it's labeled as such. And then right next to that is the positive. So that's why I'm able to have the, the LED just simply plugged in to negative and positive with the positive being the longer leg of the LED. Okay. Then I've got the ground from the Raspberry Pi GPIO. This is the T-cobbler, and it shows me that this is the ground. So I've taken that, and I've used a lead to take it to the negative. So my ground is now on this entire line of the negative channel. So anything that I plug into the blue, see that blue stripe? Anything I plug into that will be connected to the ground on the Raspberry Pi once this is plugged into the GPIO. So then with the yellow cable just up here, because it's on the same horizontal line as the ground, that's why it's plugged in there. You couldn't just throw it anywhere down the line, correct? 
You could, oh, as, okay. as long as it's touching a contact, because as long as it touches a contact in the negative line, so when it's in this line, it will, it will basically connect to all of the holes that are in this line. Okay, okay? makes sense. On the right-hand side and the left-hand side, where it says positive and negative, positive and negative, it's like that. But this is basically two, two separate sides, so I'm working all on the right-hand side of my board. Okay. So if I, if I take this LED, for example, and I move it down to down here, that is exactly the same connection. Okay. It doesn't matter where it is as long as I've got the positive and negative connected. Okay. Okay. Reason I put it up here is just so it's a little more visible on the camera because my laptop gets in the way here on the show. Right. The positive, which is pin 18 on the Raspberry Pi, uh, which is just the one I'm using for the GPIO so that I can program it, that comes, so pin 18 comes out, and I'm using this tether here to go down. I'm just plugging it in anywhere. But on the middle channel here, it goes this way, horizontal. So now anything that I, so I've plugged this in here, anything that I plug in next to it will have the positive. All right, I hope that makes sense. It does. So this is now connected. So this resistor that's next to the red, because it's on the same line that way. Same horizontal line. I know they're, yep. it's really, really fine. But it's right next to it, the, where, where the resistor goes in. So the positive, is connected to the resistor on this end, and then the resistor carries that current to the positive here. So then, th even though it's kind of stretched out on the board, really it's just a big circular loop. You could do this in a little tiny pla space. Right, okay. Absolutely. Um, the reason that I brought it down here was because I didn't want the resistor to accidentally come in contact with, with something else. Or Fair enough. Whatever, right? Sorry, I didn't but mean to throw you off. I just, no, no, I thought in case good. somebody's watching this and they're, tr they're like, why isn't it working? Yeah. That, you know. the, the pin assignment, as far as where I put this, doesn't matter as long as I wire it correctly. So I could put this up here. Yep. Okay, so I've now moved the red up here. So now there is nothing going to the resistor because there's nothing in line with it. Okay. Right. So now I have to take this resistor. I'm going to connect the positive terminal first. And the reason that I do that is what if I accidentally plug it into the negative and then short circuit my board? Yeah, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. So I've plugged that into the positive terminal. And now I'm going to plug it in to the same line as the red cable. Okay. All right. So it doesn't matter where it is up and down as long as it's in, in the right lineup. Perfect. Okay. No, nope, that makes sense. Cool. All right. All right. So let's plug it in. There we go. So it is hot, baby. All right. And I'm going to jump over to... Python here, which is running as super user. The reason that I need to do that is because um, it, it needs access to the GPIO, which only the super user can do. So I'm going to import um, the capabilities of the Raspberry Pi GPO, GPIO. So I'm going to go import rpi.gpio as GPIO. So just typed exactly as I've shown there. And then we need to set the mode of the GPIO to uh, Broadcom, so set mode GPIO.BCM. These are just kind of, we're just setting up our script. Uh, let's see what I did. Most recent call last, STD in. G oh, I missed an O. GPIO.set mode GPIO.BCM. That looks a little nicer. And then, now I know that I'm using pin 18, so I need to actually set it up as an output. So I need to go GPIO, which I set up in the first, um, in the first line, dot setup, and I'm going to use pin 18, comma, and we're going to set that as GPIO dot out. Enter. Uh, let's see what that tells me there. Oh, that's so tiny! <laughs> What did I type wrong? GPIO dot setup 18 GPIO dot out GPIO dot setup You guys see what I've done wrong? No, I don't. Uh, possibly space after 18 comma? Or mm. do you need that? Uh, you don't need it, but it shouldn't matter. What did I type differently? How did I get a typo there? I don't see it, folks. I don't either. Well. <laughs> 
Now what I need to do is I need to actually tell the output of pin 18 to turn on. So true or false. True, if I did it right. Jeff, can you hit the light switch right behind you? Because that's going to allow us to kind of see. Ah, oh, it's oh. dimmer in here. Okay. I think it's on. It's on. Okay. Now I'm going to change that to false. That's off. off. Yeah, you can definitely see. On, off, on, off. <laughs> and I don't know what my typo was there. I, I just, I don't see it, but <laughs> I'll watch this back and I'll see it. So basically what we've done is we've used that T-Cobbler Plus. You can hit that light again if you like. Um, and then we've used the Python programming language in the mm -hmm. terminal on a Raspberry Pi to be able to turn on and off the light, which essentially what we're actually doing is turning on and off pin 18, right. positive current. So it sends a, a current through pin 18. Right. Uh, so that is the most basic example of what we can do. Now, you know, the next step is, okay, once you've got all the kit, then we can start doing some really exciting stuff. Right. Um, there's a lot of stuff to come. I know NEMS is going to be using the GPIO coming up soon. Really? Which is so that's really cool. looking forward to that as well. So there you have it. Uh, head on over to ca uh, cat5.tv slash pi for a Raspberry Pi and the T Cobbler Plus. And if you want to look at the maker kit and all the accessories, cat5.tv slash maker is where you'd want to go. Uh, and check that out. Good times. Awesome. We had one Thank question you. in the chat room. Please. Why is it called a breadboard? Why is it called a breadboard? Yep. Serious question. Once again, you could, you could Google that. What? I could. I don't know. Uh, okay. Well, Why did someone name it a breadboard? I don't know. Well, I you know what? You guys really are going to have to figure that out yourself. I personally feel like it should be called a waffle board. Maybe because it looks like, a, like what you would cut bread on? Maybe. I don't or know. Or maybe because it's the best thing since sliced bread? Yes. You know, true fact. I don't know I said it in the chat room. Waffles are just pancakes with abs. <laughs> Back in the day, circuits were often constructed by wiretapping components onto nails driven into flat pieces of wood that resembled breadboards. Bread yeah, there you go. Oh, there so you go. So it's like an, an homage to the old days. <laughs> yes. Okay. A lot like of stuff it. is. A lot of stuff is. <laughs> all right, Sasha, we should head over to the newsroom. I know we're, you know, I'm using up all your time tonight. I know, right? Move we're having fun, over. though, right? That's, are we having we fun? We are having a blast. Having I fun. actually right. really love episodes like this where I can... Um, where I can learn from the beginning. What I think that the, the <laughs> viewers need to know, too, is that I'm learning. This right. is like an experience for me. Like sure. I'm learning as we go and as we, as we grow. And, and I'm learning stuff like how to, how to do this, and I love it. Like the soldering episode. Yeah, and it's so it's basic good. for yeah. somebody who knows how to do this stuff. But for somebody who's never done electronics in their life, I've been a computer guy all my life, and now to understand it and becoming more and more versed at it. I'm excited to be able to fix things. I'm excited to be able to service things and replace resistors yeah. on circuit boards so that I don't have to replace an entire circuit board. Yes. It's awesome. Yeah. It's really cool. But now... But now the news. <laughs> Here are the stories we're covering this week in the Category 5.TV newsroom. T-Mobile admits that hackers stole their customers' data in a major security breach. IBM is patenting a coffee-delivering drone that can read your mind. Google Go, the tech giant's search app optimized for emerging markets, can now read websites out loud. And happy birthday, Linux. These stories are coming right up. Don't go anywhere. Jeff Weston. Yeah, man. You're building a brand new beautiful website. What? Aren't you? No. Am I? Oh, you're a terrible actor. What? This is where acting comes into play. Oh, I didn't know we were acting. You're supposed to act. Okay, fair enough. All right. yeah, I'm building a really cool website. Are you building a really cool website? Just because Jeff is confused doesn't mean you have to be. Visit cat5.tv slash dreamhost to sign up for unlimited web hosting for your website with unlimited email accounts, MySQL databases, the latest version of PHP, WordPress, and more, and even a free domain name registration. It's less than $6 per month, so sign up today. cat5.tv slash dreamhost. This is the Category 5.TV Newsroom, covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. I'm Sasha Rickman, and here are the top stories we're following this week. In a statement Friday, T-Mobile admitted that hackers have breached its systems and stolen customer data, including names, addresses, account numbers, and billing zip codes. The company said that it discovered the security breach on August 20th and immediately shut it down. 
A company representative said that around 3% of T-Mobile customers may have been affected, meaning around 2 million accounts. T-Mobile CEO John Ledger said on Twitter that it's always a good idea to regularly change account passwords, and T-Mobile admitted that some encrypted passwords may have in indeed been in the data stolen. According to the company's timeline, the breach was only discovered on August 20th and affected customers first began to be notified by text message on Friday. However, the text looks suspiciously like a phishing attempt, complete with a link to a shortened URL to learn more. The message reads, hello, we ID'd and shut down an unauthorized capture of your info. No financial info slash SSN taken, but some personal info may have been. More at t, dot, t slash mo dot co slash security. So that sounds like a, like it sounds dodgy, right? You know, it it's sounds fishy. like it's another fishy. day in tech news. Data breach, stolen passwords. But what kind of... Way company, of, I'm holding uh, my tongue, would release an email like or a message like that to their customers. Like we in security and data security teach our customers never don't fall for that type of message. Right. No bank is ever going to email you and say, click here to sign in. Right. It's not gonna happen. They're gonna no, you know you know how to log into your online banking, so log into your online banking. This We're not is, gonna give you a link. Right, so this is actually really dangerous because then this is a legit way, and it seems so non-legit. It's actually them. It's actually them. They actually them. sent it. It but was legitimately T-Mobile. Right, so now they're giving like a false sense of security and safety to people who follow it, and there isn't an issue. So right? here's the thing. All of your data has just been stolen. Right, click And here. now we are teaching our customers that when a phishing scam looking message comes through that you can trust it. Yep. It's really yeah. us. So now that this data ha has been stolen, what's it going to be used for? Phishing scams? Yeah. Click yeah. here to find out more. <laughs> this is banana. So what would you recommend uh, that T-Mobile do? They like, fire their security staff. And that's a anyone. really great idea. <laughs> that would be a start. I mean, I feel like wouldn't it be okay just to put it on the news? Like, it, like I f what? How I else would you it. tell? No, your, because because you can't do it via email. The, the easiest way would just send a subsequent email saying, "We sent out an email that said do this. Please don't do that." <laughs> you know, like I, I, the, the damage is done. We can't teach our customers to do something stupid. That cannot but done be. It. That ca they have done. So that. they need to send an email to educate and say, "Don't do what we told you to do." We Would just need to backtrack and say, "This is the new message. We've been hacked. Your yeah. data has been stolen. Right. Contact us for more information. You can find out more by looking at your bill." Yep. Right. That's it. That's it. That's. Don't click a link at t mo dot co.uk slash security whatever <laughs> slash security oh my goodness <laughs> whose idea was that it wow. was a friday for one thing <laughs> that's I'm true. pretty sure you know what it's almost the weekend let's just put a link on oh, that's right yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow boy. IBM has filed a patent for a mood-sensing coffee delivery drone. It features facial recognition, psychological profiling, and scalding liquid flying through the air. IBM's plans for aerial hot beverage deliveries not only include deliveries of pre-ordered brews, but also taxi-style flagging down of aerial drinks. The U.S. Patent Office filing revealed that IBM thinks such a delivery system is part of our future. In the patent application, they talk about a coffee-laden drone flying into an area including a plurality of people scanning the people using one or more sensors connected to the drone the one or more sensors connected to an electronic processing circuit which identifies an individual among the people that may have a predetermined cognitive state Put another way, if you're feeling glum, IBM wants a circling coffee drone to sense this and then fly hot drinks at you. The details of the filing have suggested IBM's drone sensors could be collecting and analyzing data on everything from the time of day to facial expressions, your gestures, and even the dilation of your pupils. It hopes to merge this with your work calendar as well as the time an individual woke up in the morning. All right. At first. I was like, ah, sweet. Bring I, on the flying coffee. I love coffee. Yeah. 
And then I'd I- see it coming and I'd be like, I'm sad face. <laughs> give me a coffee. Okay, and maybe Sense they would give you idea. like a coffee on a special day, like your birthday, just for free. Like, happy birthday. Oh, Here's a special coffee. Like, yeah. it would be so good mm. if it wasn't obviously some sort of weird privacy ploy right but, like it's like but here's here's the thing though like the, police or something. the idea of personal privacy in a public setting of video feeds is out the window right like there used to be a time and day when news companies couldn't air a clip unless they had the approval of everybody who was on film now it's like you don't want to go on air you need to tell me because we're automatically going to put you on there right and so this whole thing is just biometric collection for data and marketing purposes it's it's going to happen they also know what time you woke up and how dilated your pupils are and whether you're or not, you're just about to lose it. Like, don't give that guy coffee. He's going to throw it at somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> you they're, can't tell that by the eyes. Apparently, they're using social tactics as well to make people want this service. So I don't know what the future holds for it, but hmm. to think that a drone will fly down and give the popular kids right. a coffee eh, so that just, everybody else is like, hey, I want some of that. You know, like when you're walking through and everybody's walking around with cotton candy. You know yeah. the kids are asking for it. The See, way to get my full attention is to start a story with something's going to deliver you a coffee. But, by drone. But the dark side of that is now there's drones that are flying up and down the street that maybe no longer have coffee. Maybe they just write tickets. Maybe they just police you. And because they, they know you, right. because these things use AI to know who you are, they just be like, oh, there's Robbie, give him a coffee. Oh, there's Robbie, give him a coffee. Oh, there's Robbie, give him a coffee. Right. They, so, they know me. They know my trends. The and one thing about this story, to- like, guaranteed you're not going to see this one coming. I wonder if this was inspired by a friend of mine. Uh, do you know John Steingart from Hawk Nelson? Mm-hmm. So he's a big drone enthusiast. And Oh, yeah, I remember this. About three years ago, yeah. he was playing with his drone, and he decided he to do it on YouTube. a pickup of a coffee from Starbucks using yep. his drone. He was sitting there on the beach, and it, the drone took off, flew up the road to the Starbucks, came down. They handed the coffee to the machine. Yep. It took it back up into the air and br- brought it back to him. He used their app ordering system. Yes. Right. And so it was a phenomenal video that went nuts. I was talking to somebody the other day who had seen it I'm like I know the guy they're like shut up so <laughs> how much you want to bet this inspired that and they that's go oh we could totally do that yeah. if that's the case I hope he gets royalties he should I hope he gets royalties I hope that this is not as bad as I feel like it it's is it's going to go horrible you yeah. just won't know because you won't see the database <laughs> or they're of gonna information start putting like some random drug in your coffee to make you more complacent and com- you know compliant and you're going to get these coffees but really it's just going to oh, be like dark. Yeah, it did. Now we're talking about like Black Mirror <laughs> chemical manipulation. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, isn't that what caffeine is? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Excuse me one second. There. <laughs> yeah. See, it happened. Now uh-huh. I want one Go too. Ahead. Okay. Yep. Thanks. Yep. See, Mine's empty. Pressure. Peer pressure. I, I've chemicalized enough as I can. Mm. I feel much better now. There we go. See. Now we can resume. <laughs> We've been keeping an eye on some of the accessibility enhancements coming to smart devices lately, and this week, Google Go, the tech giant's search app optimized for emerging markets, can read websites out loud. The company has updated its browser with the ability to read web pages in 28 different languages using a natural sounding voice that works even on a 2G connection. The tech giant has announced the new feature at its annual event in India, which is one of the markets Android Go was created for. According to Google, the the app's new ability takes the old text-to-speech idea and gives it a brain. They're using AI to determine the most important parts of a web page, and it will only read those sections and leave out everything else. For instance, if it's reading a cooking blog, users don't have to listen to it drone on and on about a writer's life story before reaching the recipe itself. Since Android Go was designed for affordable phones with the most basic of specs, some devices built for the platform could also have relatively tiny screens. This ability can make it easier for users to consume written content in the same way one would listen to an audio to audio while doing something else, like exercising or cooking or while on the go. 
However, it will probably be the most useful for those with vision problems, difficulty reading, or even those learning a new language. As an added bonus, the browser displays what it's reading and highlights each word as it goes, making it viable as a learning tool. That is cool. That Very is cool. cool. So you could learn really 28 different languages. Hmm. Really? Mm -hmm. uh, with yeah, I guess. And Google Translation Service is fantastic. So you could oh, yeah. use that in tandem with this. Sure. Right. You could. That would be cool. See, I just have to find the time for that. Right. <laughs> I don't have time for that. The AI that decides what's important worries me because what if... Oh, everything is dark with you tonight. No, because the writer's life story, it's not dark. It's just, I, w I just want to know how it's deciding what the important thing is, right? So are you able to... Well, let's just do a, what's okay. a recipe for lentils. Okay. Let's, I'm going to click on the first thing that comes up. Okay. All right. So it's a, it's a list of lentils. Lentil. Re oh, here's the lentil recipe. So it starts with, we love lentils here at Kitchen. They are magically easy to cook on the stove and versatile enough to go into a wide range of cuisines. Plus, they are quick. What more? Ah. Really? So but think about that. You don't, I just asked for a recipe for lentils. You never read that? Why would I read that? What, but when I'm looking for okay, a recipe. Okay, that's true. If I wanted the yes. backstory, fine. I've scrolled down. That's true, okay. Two thirds of the, no, way. Okay, I've now scrolled down what I would say is equivalent to about three or four eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper. Yep. And the recipe still hasn't started. It's starting to explain Lentil bowls. One bowl meals are one of my favorite things to keep in constant... Oh, okay. Right, okay. okay. So imagine... Uh, this is the first thing I Googled, uh, like just lentil recipe. Right. So I if I... Just using that example because it was in the story, just give me the recipe. Right. Okay. Right? It's going to read it to me like um, like Alexa would or like Goog Google's... Right. Okay, okay. Google would. Yes. Right? Y yes, you have. Neat. That is really neat. You have a very good point. And th the truth of the matter is, there are people who are visually impaired that mm -hmm. will now be able to explore web pages Surely. on a, an expensive device, right? Yeah. And so. I've used text to speech a fair bit in my time. Yep. Mm -hmm. And on a website, it can be annoying because you got to think if 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 it's going to read everything on the screen. Home, about us. Not to mention all the us. embedded information in, a, in an image. Does it read also sure, pop-ups? Oh. It might. It might read advertisements. Yeah. Like an, an annoying based. voice that just interrupts. <laughs> Click here. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This I is, think that's smart. So this is great. Do away with ads and stuff as it's reading to me. And, and if it is pretty good, if it's intelligent enough, then it would be like, uh, like an Alexa-type service that would take me to a website. And then it's just integrating that service back into yep. OK Google and Alexa and everything else. That's, it's actually, it's awesome that accessibility features like this are, are not only existing, but they're getting better as we go. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So. And they sound better. Like you said, it's very natural sounding. Mm -hmm. we've, we've looked at voice, like text-to-speech here on the show. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you wouldn't even know the difference. That's right. right. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Incredible. So stick an AI on that. I'll be replaceable soon. <laughs> <laughs> Never. Happy 27th birthday, Linux. Yes, it is once again the time of year when we celebrate the hero of modern computing, the Linux kernel. Some FOSS fans consider the first public release of prototype code, which dropped on October 5th, 1991, as a more worthy of being the kernel's true anniversary date. Others take this past Saturday, August 25th, as the birth date of the project, and for good reason. The 25th of August is the day back in 1991 a young Finnish college student named Linus Torvalds sat at his desk to let folks on comp dot os dot minix news group know about the hobby os he was working on the hobby os that wouldn't he cautioned be anything big or professional here's what Linus said in that original post, Hello everybody out there using Minix. I am doing a free operating system, just a hobby, won't be big or professional like GNU, for 386, 486 AT clones. This has been brewing since April and it's starting to get ready. I'd like 
I'd like any feedback on things people like or dislike in Minix as my OS resembles it somewhat. Same physical layout of the file system due to practical reasons, among other things. And look at Linux now. Which birthday you celebrate is up to you. For what it's worth, Linus says that he's cool with people celebrating either date or even both. Way to go, Linux! Yay! Yay! As a person born on April 21st, I also celebrate two birthdays because the Queen does, and she was also born on April 21st. So, so Linux like, is like me. There you go. There we go. Cool. Also, Wikipedia has some excellent information about kind of the pr like how Linux started and what what how it evolved. Yeah. Um, I'd encourage you to check that out if you're you know interested in it. Um, Linux is everywhere. Yeah, um, we looked at Raspberry Pi here on Category Five Technology TV. Uh, our computers are powered by Linux. You may have Windows, but maybe there are some components of Linux that are involved right. in that. Um, your phone, if you use an Android phone, it's Linux. Yeah. Um, what else has Linux on it? Your fridge, if you've got Android a smart boxes. Fridge. Android I think TV boxes. Are yeah. PlayStation's Linux? PlayStation's. Yeah, I do are believe they Linux. are. Yeah. yeah. Some ATMs are Linux. If you've ever heard of Steam, Steam OS is Linux. Yep. Right. Mm -hmm. Linux is bigger than you'd think. Basically, like, the world runs on Linux. Nothing really big does. or professional. Microsoft doesn't want you to know this. Yeah. yeah. They really don't. But yeah. the internet, you use the internet every day. Guess what makes the internet go? Linux. Yep. Yep. So, happy birthday. No wrinkles, even. Yeah. It's looking youthful at 27. You know me. I like, <laughs> I like I community mindedness. I really like open source everything. I like the idea. And I love Linux. That's what makes Linux so great is that being that it's community driven, mm -hmm. it's like if I have an idea for Linux or if I find a bug in Linux, I can submit the fix for that. Right. And then the creators of Linux can look at that and say, oh, yeah, oh, look at that. You found that. And we merge that pull request into the actual kernel. And that's why there are thousands of contributors to Linux. And then, taking it one step further, so Linux being the kernel, right. now you've got X or whatever um, environment you're using, um, and then you've got your desktop environment, like GNOME mm -hmm. or KDE or whatever. So when you look at your computer, so you look at Ubuntu, for example, it might be GNOME 3 or it might be Unity if it's an older one. Um, and older Linux was GNOME 2. And right. so the interface that you see is a whole other project on top of Linux. Right. And yeah. so many people just kind of help to lift that into the air and make it be. Right? Like it's... Ah, I love Huge. it. It's like a flash awesome. mob. Like a flash mob. Flash mob. Wow. <laughs> like joyous community cooperation. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Big thanks to Roy W. Nash and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us this week. Thanks for watching the Category 5.TV newsroom. Don't forget to like and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And for more free content, be sure to check out our website. From the Category 5.TV newsroom, I'm Sasha Rickman. Thanks, Sasha. I'm Robbie Ferguson. This is Jeff yep. and Sasha. And it's been great having you here with us this week. Um, don't forget... Um, head on over to our website, category5.tv. We've got lots of great programming there. Check it out. Um, if you want to become a part of this community, uh, join the chat room, mm -hmm. send us an email, join the community forum. There's so many different ways to interact. Oh, yeah. If you watch us on YouTube, you can comment below the video. Make sure you give us that thumbs up, the subscribe, and click and that the bell. bell. Yeah. That's right, <laughs> the bell. We learned that tonight. <laughs> and uh, we look forward to seeing you again next week. Have See a good one.